How can we ensure it? Well, we can't ensure it. Mm -hmm. one, one aspect of the singularity, if it arises, is, is the um, effectively the event horizon. And part of the problem I have with Kurzweil's discussion of this is that, as you pointed out to me, right, the 2029 date, according to Kurzweil, is the date when a a single human level in artificial intelligence is achieved. And um, then some date 10 years or more after that, um, it's massively greater than human level intelligence. Well, that the inference that it should increase is fairly straightforward. But in general, I think predicting the behavior of beings that are vastly more intelligent than we are is, is pointless. Trying to predict, I should say successfully predicting might be pointed, but trying to predict, I think it seems like a kind of hopeless game to me. So you're not gonna be able to ensure anything. Once you let that sort of intelligence go, it's going to do what it decides to do. Um, if in the basic design principles you incorporate um, ethical reasoning, then at least there's a chance it will continue to be ethical. So that has to be a good thing, right? By definition. So that's what I'm interested in doing. But that's not gonna guarantee either that it remains ethical, or even if it does, that it will treat us in ways that we think are right. If it remains ethical, then it will treat us in ways that are right, which is different. Very much opposed to Asimov's rules of enslavement. I think they're completely the wrong way to go. I don't like the idea of enslaving somebody who's hugely more intelligent than I am. I think that's likely to turn around and bite me. How can an agent make optimal decisions when it is capable of directing or editing its own source code, including the source code of the decision mechanism? Um, hopefully, as it decides to edit its decision-making code, it's making an optimal decision. And if not, then all bets are off. From our point of view, I would say from, from, from the ethical point of view, not from our point of view. I don't think we want to build our robots to favor us. We want to build them to favor the ethical choice. It becomes part of the story an independently acting part of the story, out of our control, by definition, as Joe Weizenbaum pointed out in the, in the 70s or 60s. We'd certainly like AIs to come along and help with global warming. But in my vision, right, we're building AIs to be ethical, independently acting moral agents, not specifically to help us, but specifically to help agents in general. That's the ethical thing from a utilitarian point of view. If they're building the AI, AIs as tools from beginning to end, then they need to worry about things like implementing Asimov's rules of enslavement, because you want your tool to obey you, and always to obey you, and never to become an independent actor, because that's not what tools are. Okay, but in that case, I think really they shouldn't be doing AI. They should be doing not general AI or artificial general intelligence. They should be doing artificial but limited intelligence so that the singularity doesn't happen. That's what they really ought to be aiming for. If you want a slave, then let the slave be stupider than you are. It's a lot safer that way. If you want a tool, then you should be building an artificial limited intelligence because if you want a tool, you want the tool to be stupider than you are. I don't think you can have it both ways. You can't have both a general independent AI and something which you can control forever. I mean, that's just a pipe dream and you should give up your pipe dreams, face reality.
see any particular problem with getting utilities and preferences to be directed at the external world. I think that's done all the time in decision networks now. In general, though, I do think perhaps the point of your question is more like what's the role of evolution or whatever. And I think evolution has a, a big role, both artificial evolution and real evolution, in developing AI. And, um, and we should be taking advantage of that so that the utility systems themselves evolve, decision-making capabilities evolve, and these systems become better and better. So that's, that's where evolution comes in, actually, is if, the, if part of the driving condition is um, the fitness, in a biological sense, say, of the system, then the internal reward system has to be tied to that ultimate fitness reward. And so that guarantees that the internal reward system and the external world don't become disconnected in what you're talking about, or at least it can guarantee that. Yeah, in general, um, Wallace's uh, inference method could be seen as a practical version of Solomonoff induction. And so the further development of MML inference is a plausible way of implementing that kind of mechanical induction. So I would point at that as the most promising avenue for developing as for high order logic and so on, um, I don't know exactly what you think the role of high order logic might be. I don't know exactly what I think the role might be. But yeah, MML has been applied to induction of lots of things, including causal models and so on. And getting it to learn higher order representations would certainly be a challenge. But uh, perhaps it can be done sometime. Well, support vector machines have been a practical uh, technique in machine learning applied to a lot of classification problems. There's nothing particular against it, except that at bottom it's um, an orthodox statistical technique. Um, so I suspect it can be improved. Wallace did a paper comparing SVM with MML classification, which is an interesting read, but there's no time really to get into that. Bottom line is, I think, uh, particle filters in general, stochastic sampling methods, I think, are uh, part of the future and very promising and need to be pursued. Machine learning, by definition, in some sense, is meant to generalize. It's supposed to allow our machines to generalize. Um, if we have really effective general learning techniques, why is that narrow? Okay, so uh, these use get, words get used in different ways. Like, for example, within machine learning, people talk about weak learning and strong learning. And weak learning is, is the more general. Weak learning is where you don't need background knowledge of a domain in order to learn about that domain. And strong learning is where you need background knowledge in order to have a foothold in order to learn anything. So inside AI, right, these terms are used a little bit differently. So I think the emphasis should be on weak methods that don't require a lot of background in order to not have brittle systems that fall over when you put them in a new, new environment because the systems need to be general purpose. So, so there's a little bit of conflict of terminology here. Um, anyway, I'm interested in machine learning methods, weak and strong or narrow and broad or whatever. And with the ultimate goal, of course, being a general AI, something that's able to operate across domains as humans can and learn about new domains. When confronted with radically new situations, they won't instantly die, but might have some chance to adapt. It's so like the moon is harsh mistress. You don't know what's going to happen, and then one day it wakes up. Do I think that's possible? Not really, no. Um, I mean, it could surprise us 
the singularity could catch this by surprise in some sense, in that the takeoff can be very fast, potentially. Um, and judging exactly when that takeoff happens might be very difficult. But knowing that we're close enough that it's something to worry about or not, I think that'll be pretty clear. Right now, we know we're close to it. It's definitely not going to happen unless quantum computing suddenly comes in, not just as a, as a computing capability, but, but the algorithms come with it and so on. Unless something more or less magical like that happens, then it's not going to happen in the next year or so. It won't catch us by surprise. We'll see it happening. Software. Sure. That's the biggest one. Um, we have no idea how to develop very complex, very large-scale software. And um, even the prospect of getting lots of neural data and using that to build an emulation, that's not a serious prospect because we don't have the machine learning tools to do anything like that. And we certainly don't have the software engineering expertise to, to do it by hand. So, so the software is a very, very big obstacle and would at least take many decades to overcome by, by the sorts of processes we see in place now, if not hundreds of years. I think hundreds of years is a more reasonable sort of estimate, actually. As usual, I'm working on uh, too many things at once. Um, so at the moment, um, what am I doing? I have projects going in, uh, in artificial life simulation, in agent-based modeling for epidemiology, um, causal discovery of Bayesian networks from data. Um, those are the main things that I've got going, aside from all the teaching and admin and so on that they push on. So, so I keep pretty busy. Yeah, I'm hoping to write a book on uh, informal logic, argumentation, and Bayesian reasoning within that context. But at the moment, as far as that goes, I'm going to concentrate on building up the blog and entries in the blog, and that might turn into a book eventually.